Section 2 of Association Football and How to Play It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 2, Chapters 4 and 5. Chapter 4, Forward Play. A good forward line is perhaps a club's chief asset. If the forwards continue to attack, the defence has an easy time, and as previously mentioned, the best defence is attack. It's not the man who scores that is necessarily the best forward, but to get goals should be the aim of a forward whether he gets the goal himself or leaves a comrade to shoot the ball into the net. From this it will be gathered that a forward should really understand something of the art of goalkeeping, so that he may know how best to defeat the goalkeeper. The object of every forward movement should be to get to the goal by the nearest way possible, eluding the goalie by placing the ball out of his reach. We have all heard of Johnny Goodall's method in this line. It is a well-known fact that he used to put a tall hat on top of the bar and endeavor to knock it off. In this way, he practically put the ball wherever he wanted to, and this was the great secret of his goal-scoring power, which, as I have already remarked, is the chief asset in a forward. While we are on the point of shooting, another thing is to be able to take the ball on the run, which is to say that a forward should shoot without having to trap the ball. By doing so, he gives the goalkeeper no possible chance of knowing where it is going. If he can do this while running at top speed, he will certainly be an artist in this department, and no one was better able to do this than Stephen Bloomer, the great international. I have often been asked what was the secret of his success, and I've always put it down to this reason, running at top speed and being able to give the ball, without slackening down, the final kick into the net. In the last decade, the forward line was purely individualist, and there were certainly many giants of the game. Combination was, generally speaking, unknown, and every forward was quite on his own. The forward line is now a combined one, and in one way it is more effective than the old style. It is hardly possible to get a blending of both, but it can be done, and if a team are fortunate enough to do so, they would certainly come out on top at the end of the season. It is a recognized fact that the forward play of today is rather too mechanical, and we miss the individual efforts that we used to appreciate so very much in the days gone by. Naturally, the center forward is the connecting link of the rank. He should be tall, a fine dribbler, and more often an individualist than any of his comrades. He should also be able to keep his wings well together and distribute the play to the best advantage, and most of all, to be a fine shot. The inside forwards should do what is called the donkey work, to fetch and carry and to help the halfbacks when they are in a dilemma. Theirs is the most thankless job of the lot, and a great deal done by them is often unappreciated. How often I have heard the crowd cheer a center forward for a goal while the man who did so much to lead up to it was quite overlooked. Happily, he has the consolation of knowing that the men with him quite appreciate his work, as also does the educated public. I always try to impress upon the young and old that it is not the man who scores the goal that deserves the credit, but that in an ideal forward line each one should work for the benefit of the side, treating the getting of the goal as a mere item of the play. Perhaps, having played mostly on the inside, I may be inclined to be biased. Still, I think not, and I can fortunately plead my long connection with the game, and I care not what others may say, this is the esprit de corps that must prevail in any team which intends to reach the highest pinnacle in the association world. One would imagine that it is the simple duty of the inside right to pass the ball to his outside man or on occasions to the center forward, but this is far from being correct and one of the most effective passes is from the inside right to outside left, or vice versa, from inside left to outside right. The reasons for this are obvious. In the first place, all the play is concentrated on the right wing, and the outside left, being correctly placed, passes it with a long swing to him, and that always means danger to the opposition. Another reason is that he retrieves the play to a certain extent by carrying the play right up the field and so giving the defense an opportunity to reveal itself. An inside forward must also come back for the throw-in when the ball goes out of touch. Coming to the outside man, he should be able to shoot accurately from any angle. Often, 
a great failing of his is running the ball towards the corner flag instead of making a beeline for goal. It is given to few to be able to land the ball in the mouth of the goal from the corner flag when on the run, and even if anyone is able to do so, it would certainly be more effective to make straight for the goal. I do not believe in an outside forward coming to the assistance of the defence, save under exceptional circumstances. An outside may do so and receive a cheer for it, but it is much more important that he should be in position to take up the ball next time it is sent to where he should be waiting. One of the virtues that an outside man should possess is that of patience. Often, on the run of play, the ball goes on quite the opposite side of the field, and he must control the impulse to go after it. It is a great mistake to leave your place, for when the ball does come along, the outside man will be practically clear and have a straight run before him. I know it is a great strain on an outside man to stand still while all the others are in the thick of the play. Still, it is his place to do so, and it should be done. Centering the ball is a great feature, and the best position from which to do so is about 30 yards out, landing the ball close upon the 12 yards line. If he puts the ball further than that, the goalkeeper is in a position to catch it and thus save the position. The art of being able to place corner kicks effectively is a thing of the past. Perhaps this is due to the restrictions against charging the goalkeeper unless he is in actual contact with the ball. Still, it behooves an outside man to study this point. It may seem strange, but the best way for the outside right to kick is with his left foot. The same applies to the outside left. He should kick with his right foot. The reason here is surely obvious, because kicks with your left foot from the right wing cause a slight swerve on the ball. There have been many great forwards in both the individual and combination line. Aston Villa maintained that Archie Hunter was the greatest center forward and the best general that ever kicked a ball, and this statement is endorsed by very many competent judges. I was fortunate enough to see him play in Scotland when on tour 20 years ago, and he very greatly impressed me. As I was very young at the time, perhaps I should not make any definite statement. I have played with Geo Smith, and he was a great forward, as also is VJ Woodward, with whom I have played in later days. These three played the game as it should be played. With no unnecessary charging, they always got on the ball, and knew when it was best to dribble and when to shoot. William Bassett, of West Bromwich Albion fame, was a great outside right, and could center the ball from any position. He and Johnny Goodall, now manager of Watford, made a great wing. We all know the abilities of Bloomer, who has been the greatest goal-getter of recent years. The outside left position is the most difficult one to fill in the forward line, and consequently there have not been so many giants in this position. Probably this is owing to the fact that few can kick as well with both feet, but with practice there should be no difficulty in acquiring this accomplishment. Chapter 5. Training Not the least important thing about football is the matter of training, and nearly every professional club has a trainer, whose business it is not only to get the men fit, but also to keep them so for eight months. I've spoken to a great many whose work it is to get their men into condition and to keep them so, and I find that a great many of them have different methods, but nearly all are agreed that every individual must be taken by himself. The majority of people, however, are not paid players, although, as I have already said, these are largely increasing in number because year by year we see fresh clubs springing up. Besides which, every member of an ordinary club should be bound to turn out in as perfect a condition as possible. Many make a practice of walking to and from their work, and this in itself is excellent. When Montague Holbane was training for his channel swims, he used to make a practice of walking from Catford to the city and also back, a distance of several miles, and this he found very valuable indeed. In the early days of some of the more important clubs, a great many of the players who were professionals went to their ordinary occupations all the week and used to play on a Saturday. When West Bromwich Albion, captained by William Bassett, won the English Cup against Preston North End 20 years ago, the Midlanders were all local lads, whose wages totaled about £10 a week, while Preston's pay list was four times as much. Indeed, men who are regularly at work, especially if it be out of doors and if it taxes one's bodily powers, need very little training. No one ought to play football unless he has a sound constitution, 
and every organ in the body must be sound, especially the heart and lungs. It is a game for those who are healthy and vigorous. A good plan is to pursue some exercise during the closed season, i.e. the summer months. Professionals will tell you that August is their hardest month, a large number of them having done nothing since the end of April. Their muscles have become stiff, and they have probably too much surplus flesh. It is very different where professionals take up first-class cricket, and trainers have frequently told me that those professionals and amateurs who play the summer game require little or no preparation, and there are many instances of that. Take, for instance, J. Sharp, the famous Everton forward. He must be getting on in years, and yet season after season he plays cricket up until the end of August and then turns up at Goodison Park and shows how well he can carry the ball along and whip it into goal, like a rocket, though not so straight up, as one great judge has written of him. He's been an international this year. He has done splendid work as a cricketer and is second on the list of Lancashire averages, and may be described as one of the greatest all-round men in England. Now, in his 31st year, he has given evidence that if you keep in condition there is no need to worry about special preparation or anything of the sort. Another instance is E. Needham, the captain of Sheffield United, and perhaps the greatest halfback for many years that we have had. He is now 35, and it is a long time since he played his first international match, and long before he was a cricketer he had made his name as a footballer. He is a tireless worker, as anyone who has watched him with the Sheffield United club knows quite well, and long before his age many men have retired from the game. He has the respect and admiration of everyone, and this year he has come to the front as a cricketer and finished at the head of the Derbyshire averages. The result of his always keeping in condition is that he will probably go on for some years as a great cricketer, and as one career is on the wane, the other seems to be beginning. He is great indeed at both games. Two other members of the Sheffield United Club have also made their presence felt at the summer game. I refer to the two halfbacks, the brothers Wilkinson. W.H., the halfback, has never done better as a cricketer. He is a left-handed batsman and has made a great advance on anything he has done before, while B. Wilkinson is a player of some repute. Lewis of Somerset, Makepeace of Lancashire, Ducket of Surrey, Ironmonger of Knotts, and Leach and Vincette of Sussex are all cricketers who have done splendid work during the summer game and have turned out as footballers perfectly fit at the beginning of the season. Indeed, if you play cricket as it should be played, it is magnificent training for football. It is hard work getting fit at the start of the season if you have allowed your muscles to become flabby, while there may be no regular circulation of the blood, and generally the muscles that you require are very lethargic. So the difficulty is with those who do not play tennis or cricket, or go in for rowing or swimming or some other form of active exercise during the summer, that they will have to take up some serious practice. Skipping is good, walking and running, especially short sprinting, while punch ball exercise and dumbbells may be used. There should be moderation in all things, and one must start carefully at first and increase the amount of training until one feels fit. During the season, walking and some practice at kicking with an occasional sprint are quite enough to keep the player well. It is quite possible that some may suffer from the tremendous amount of energy that they put into their game. I do not think that those who work indoors, such as clerks and others who are called upon to follow indoor occupation, require more than moderate regular exercise. It is very likely that they will have to do their training after or before business hours, and in the evening brisk walking of a couple of miles with a sprint of a hundred yards four or five times is a good way of getting rid of superfluous fat, and everyone can do this if he likes though laziness will often lead some to shield themselves under the excuse they have no time. One well-known forward, thoroughly conscientious in his training, used to exercise on the embankment, an excellent plan. Everyone who has to work sitting down should take a morning bath and a little practice with a skipping rope or dumbbells. The question of diet is of some importance. The game is so strenuous and exhausting that a substantial meal should be taken at least two hours before a match. Many have a beefsteak well cooked, with stale bread and vegetables that are well done, always excluding potatoes, and they are able to play right through the game without feeling in any way fatigued. The plainer the food, the better. All players are better if they leave alone intoxicants. Needham earnestly advises young players to abstain from them. 
He says that his experience is that they do not sustain any long continued effort, and their stimulating effect is followed by an invariable depression. From my own observation of players who have abstained and those who have not, I am sure the former have done far better than the latter. Plenty of internationals and men whose names are household words are total abstainers. I remember Vivian J. Woodward at a dinner in the football season would neither touch intoxicating drinks nor smoke, and England's captain knew what he was about. Kerwin, who captained Ireland, John Goodall, one of the props of the game, John Lewis, the famous penalty king, C. Williams, the Brentford and Tottenham goalkeeper, Duckett of Woolwich Arsenal, are only a few of the total abstainers, and to them I might add R. M. Hawks, international and the Luton captain. Indeed, if you want to be of the greatest value to your side, you may take it from me that you will do better service by leaving alone all sorts of alcohol, and as to smoking, I'm quite sure that it is thoroughly bad. I see one picture which explains to me why a great deal of the slackness is creeping over our boys. Again and again, I have watched mere lads of 14 and 15, as well as young men of 25, come on to the cricket and football field smoking those horrible, cheap, inferior fags. How any captain can allow it is a great mystery to me, because if we are training for a match we always say, do not smoke a day or two before, because it interferes with one's staying powers. Yet, I have seen boys come down to Tottenham smoking all the way from London, all the time they are changing, and actually come from the dressing room with cigarettes, and blow and blow away right to the moment of kicking off. Not content with that, they get through some more cigarettes at the interval, and then wonder why they are tired before the match is over. I have often begged of our youths, if they wish to be athletes, to remember that it means a certain amount of self-denial, and if they want to do their best for their side, they will take this matter seriously to heart, and remember that smoking and drinking intoxicants make one unfit rather than otherwise. I do not think that the ordinary player need think about special training, but if, on the other hand, staleness comes to him, a complete rest is necessary. When you are overworked at the end of a long season, your feet will seem heavy, and your kicking will be uncertain, while you will fall and stumble about. This is the time to retire, and make room for someone else. With a little care, you will gain the necessary freshness, and you'll be able to tell when you have got that, because you will be anxious to play the game. End of section 2